Today on the Topping Show, Vivek Ramaswamy reacts to the Ukraine saying that they will only hold elections if the United States pays for them. You have Elon Musk versus the Anti-Defamation League. Budweiser long weekend perk tweet fails, oh, even flatter than their beer, even with censorship. Nikki Haley speaks out on defending women's sports. DeSantis on buying climate change hits 300,000 views. Disney park workers go viral for twerking. Spotify has invested $1 billion in podcasting, but still is not showing profit. Mini may kill the stick shift. Mercedes CLA concept to take on the Tesla. ESPN is dropped from Spectrum with ongoing contract disputes. And Best Buy fires the whistleblower as the boycott ensues. All of that and much more on The Topping Show. Thank you everyone for taking the time to tune in today. Today's episode of The Topping Show is sponsored by Topping Technologies. Topping Technologies is an IT value added reseller and services company with a special proficiency in IT security. Heck, I see their founder at least twice a day. Gotta say he's quite handsome and brilliant. He's me, that's the joke. If you're an IT leader or a business owner and need a little assistance, you can reach the team at sales at toppingtechnologies.com. Also, we're trying to get to 4,000 subscribers by the end of September. So if you click that button, I would greatly appreciate it. Now, going on to the business part of the podcast, you have Spotify has spent $1 billion to try to become the podcasting king, and they're still struggling to actually find a profit. Now, this isn't, well, it should be moderately concerning. They were actually founded back over in April 2006. So I know United States public schools are all-time low for math scores, science scores, history scores. So we'll do a little bit of education today. So if they're founded in April 2006, that means they're about actually 17 years old. Founded over in Sweden by Daniel Eek and Martin Morrison. Now, it looks like they spent an astonishing amount of money on talent. And I use that, if you're only listening to the show, I use my good old quotation marks. My fingers almost, almost hurt because I had to emphasize talent so much because I would say most of these are... I was about to say artists, they're certainly not artists, but they've spent, or I would say pissed away money investing or, you know, trying to invest in talent such as Kim Kardashian, which I I don't know why, why, why would anyone want a podcast of her when I'm, the whole appeal of that family is just how interesting they are on the service level. Like, I you know people watch them because they spend a disproportional amount of their income on plastic surgery. So they are supporting the local economy, presumably, but I, I can't think of anyone or could not even fathom anyone who would want to listen to them on a podcast. They also spent $25 million, so that's $100 million just for Kim Kardashian, which there's no way they broke even on that deal. I mean, I wouldn't pay, I would pay, I would pay, ne actually, wait, 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 I take that back. I would pay negative amount of money for them to not talk. So if they could somehow have that as a subscription service, I would actually pay them to just go away. But that's, another, that's not the Spotify business model. That's just something I'm thinking off the cuff, so to say. So they spent $100 million on Kim Kardashian. That's not going to pan out. They spent $25 million on the Obamas, which they may, eh, they might break even with that. I don't know. I debate how many people actually buy politicians' books, as well as their social media and things like this. I know a couple of people may be turned in, so maybe they'll break even on that investment. Now, they also spent $20 million to lock in exclusive content with Prince Harry and the insufferable Meghan Markle, which, yeah, she's up there in terms of who gives a damn what she has to say. I mean, she is so, both of the couple actually, both uh, Prince Harry and her, they're so narcissistic and insufferable. Again, I would pay a subscription service to not listen to them, and yet, Spotify thought, big name, big glamour, it's got to be worth the risk. Well, no. I mean, again, a great example of who gives a damn. He, apparently, he published a book as well, which, ironically, I did see something on social media where he got like 25 million views about the book. However, it was someone turning the book into a garbage can, which is probably the most apt, appropriate use for a book by Prince Harry. They literally ground up the book, mixed it with epoxy, and turned it to a dustbin as the Europe's might call it. In the United States, we just call it a trash bin because it's trash. So I can't help but think that was a waste of money. Now, they did spend $100 million on Joe Rogan. That is the only thing I could see them making a money, actually a profit on, since he quite is literally the most famous and successful podcaster in history. So 
in his case, that was brilliant in terms of acquiring that talent, getting him off YouTube where now he's just doing highlights of his show. I know people who download Spotify only because they acquired Joe Rogan with an exclusivity contract, myself included. I didn't have Spotify on my phone before Joe Rogan had that exclusivity contract. Now, if you wanna watch his full uninterrupted show, you have to download Spotify. And I say uninterrupted, I think that you have Spotify advertisements unless you pay for the premium XY Banana Falcon level of support, or in this case, you know, just premium package. But that was probably a prudent business decision. That was a good idea. Cause again, it's the biggest name in podcasting. He, if you look at his audience, is a very diverse. You have people on the left, people on the right, people in the middle. A lot of people tune into his show. So that, even though it sounds like a lot, $100 million, that seemed like a prudent business decision because again, this is a multi-year contract with him. They'll probably, they're, I would suspect they're making a good profit on Joe Rogan. Now, another thing they moronically paid for, they paid $286 million for a pair of podcast studios. That's beyond moronic. $286 million for two podcast studios? That's I can't think of a worst waste of money. Just a little math, that's $143 million. Again, for a podcast studio. You could spend, even my interview podcast where my IT company spent a fair amount of capital to get the best 4K cameras on the planet. We got an exceptional, what was it? The Blackmagic A10 4K Studio Switcher. We got enterprise grade hardware, and it wasn't even near six figures. It was in the five figures. And again, that stuff, the Blackmagic makes up exceptional podcasting and telecom, or I was gonna say telecom, it's more television production products. It's commercial grade, it'll last years and it's 4K. And yet they spent $143 million per studio. How are you gonna make a profit on that? that? That's just for the studio? Even if you bought land and built and constructed a building you can still keep that under, like, what is it? You can easily do that for five to 10 million, but they spent all that money. I can't see how they make money on those stupid studios. I can only presume maybe one of them's in Beverly Hills or somewhere where the land is so expensive, but even that begs the question, why put it there? Living in a global economy, you could have podcast interviews. I know ideally you wanna have face-to-face -face come to the studio, that's when you get the best production, but even at a fraction of that cost, you fly people out to wherever you have the podcast. It's ridiculous. That was probably, look at, the, look at their P&L, look at all the things they bought and sold and invested in the company. That has to be the biggest waste of money in terms of expenditures. Now, they also noted in the first six months of 2023, they lost $500 million. And they're definitely trying to get this platform to grow. They have their Spotify, the CEO, Daniel Eek, he said his goal is to make Spotify the world's largest audio company, generating $100 billion by 2030. 100 billion? I don't know what metric or where on earth he chose that number, if it's based in reality. Their current revenue as of last year was 12 billion, which again, 12 billion is a great amount of revenue. They're still struggling to get a profit. I'm sure they'll get there in time after they stop wasting money on such moronic investments or I say sunk cost as Meghan Merkel and again, $286 million for a pair of podcast studios. That's, again, buying the best equipment on the planet, it would still be less than a million dollars. So I can't fathom the moronic location or the construction of the building. That seems like the biggest waste of money. Because of course, podcasts take time to actually make an ROI. Most podcasts lose money, presumably, not indefinitely, but most of them, if they're lucky, they'll break even. The podcasting is kind of like the gold rush. The companies who are really doing well just like during the California gold rush back in the day, are companies manufacturing the supplies, such as, you know, back in the day, it was Levi jeans. Or in this case, you have Rode microphones or you have Sure microphones. I mean, there's a lot of products where, a lot of instances where they're not gonna make a profit. It's a very competitive industry. I mean, I, like, I can only do mine because my tech company offsets the cost. So it's one of those instances where, statistically speaking, most of them aren't gonna make a profit so I don't know, again, I don't know where this CEO is coming with that. Where is he coming up with that $100 billion metric? It's a great goal, but that's a, I mean, again, it's already 2023. 2030 is right around the corner. I can't fathom how they're gonna get there without taking out more capital for 
maybe they'll do a bunch of they'll buy out a bunch of the competition but even then there's not a there's not a lot of podcast hosting competitors maybe 10 big ones left maybe well, maybe seven i mean you already had stitcher biting the dust and i believe they were acquired by iHeartRadio, which is headquartered over in um, san antonio texas so it'll be interesting to see how they expect to hit that growth chart but i always say time shall tell and also this show is on spotify for free the topping show other interesting business news you have sad news you have the mini cooper they might be killing the stick shift which why make the damn thing at all of all the vehicles that are perfectly embodied to have a stick shift it's the mini cooper it's one of the best things bmw ever did back in the day if you see the old school mini coopers i believe the if you look at the delineation of the logo if it's not capitalized and so it says mini cooper then it's the original you know british owned company which perhaps can only be best appropriately compared to the public sector and inefficiencies. They had that same model car for decades and they never made a profit. I believe it was 30 to 40 years, the same machines making the same car. And even again, when, if you use a machine longer, the cost per unit goes down, they still couldn't make a profit. It was abysmal. But BMW actually went into, they wanted to get into manufacturing SUVs and get that growing market. So back in the day, they bought a bunch of British automobile companies and properties and a lot of those brands were bundled together. One of the few that they kept after they, they tried to buy Range Rover Land Rover that did not turn out very well, they did keep Mini. And the Mini with the big M, if you look at the logos, that's the one that BMW actually revamped and still owns the intellectual property and makes today. And they did a great revamp. They did a whole silly movie called The Italian Job that basically was a commercial for it, or so it seemed. And they made the car fun. There's a lot of great options, but the, the, it looks like they're going to kill the stiff shift for it, which ridiculous. So this is coming from the head of Mini, Stefan Verst, WRST. In an interview with Top Gear, he said, quote, or sorry, this is Stephanie, so probably gal. Uh, we won't have a manual, unfortunately. This is coming, this is uh, the news coming after the Mini reintroduced the manual transmission on the Cooper hatchback for the 2023 model year. The new Mini Cooper hatch will have both an, an EV version and an ICE internal combustion engine with an automatic transmission. Ridiculous. Now, it looks like the final versions of the current generation Cooper with the manual gearbox will roll off the assembly line in February 2024, according to many. And of course, they're saying, you know, if there's unprecedented demand or some variable, maybe it'll come back. But right now, that look is not good in that regard. And I mean, this is coming after just days ago where we learned that Volkswagen, they're killing a stiff shift for the Golf GTI. I mean, what the hell is next? The Miata? I mean, there are some cars that just should only come in a stick shift. It was up to me. And, but unfortunately, you have emissions and government all over the planet putting a gun to their head saying, hey, we're not going to ban... Or actually, in some countries, they are banning uh, gas cars. But in some countries, they're saying, oh, I almost, I'm trying to think of a good Dr. Evil, like an evil villain in a movie voice, but it eludes me at the moment. They're saying, well, we're not going to ban manual transmissions or V8s, but we're gonna say, if your tailpipe emissions don't hit this crazy obscure pie in the sky number, then you can't make cars. So de fact, it's a de facto ban and that's how it is in the United States. And manual transmissions get less fuel economy now with the technology and they burn more fossil fuels. So unfortunately, the demise is near for them unless we fervently write to our elected officials appropriately wherever you live as well as all companies letting them know, hey, we love the manual transmission, don't get rid of it. Why don't you focus on some real problems and do some real good in the world? But then again, they're politicians, so they probably won't. So unfortunately, it looks like another beautiful piece of engineering bites the dust this day with the Mini Cooper. Other interesting business use, you had Mercedes coming out with a CLA concept. What a great, what a great inspirational name for a vehicle. I'm a little, I'm a little, one of those folks who are just make, be creative, come up with a name. But nevertheless, they're calling it the Mercedes CLA concept car, and it's going to get 250 miles of range in 15 minutes. Hooray, because it's an EV. Now, it looks like Total is supposed to have a range of 450 miles thanks to the in research and development that they put into their CQXX concept, another great inspiring name. Now, it looks like the Mercedes Benz concept CLA class is built around the next generation electric powertrain which the German automaker developed off the backbone of the experience, the EQXX. 
and they're claiming they could charge it so quick. And it does look better than the other versions that they've had throughout the years. And they claim they're going to take on Tesla with this new technology. Now, it'll be interesting to see how many people who are currently Mercedes fans and current luxury car buyers will be attracted to a German manufactured EV. You do have a little bit of precedent. You do have Porsche coming out with their electric, what is it, the Taycan, which is a four-door EV performance sedan, depending on who you talk to. So it'll be interesting to see as these companies are moving more and more in that direction. Needless to say, it'll probably be just as reliable and as a good investment as a traditional Mercedes. As a as burn. Because of course, reliability and return on investment, no, but those those don't really exist in Mercedes, unfortunately. But as I say, time shall tell. Other interesting business news, you have ESPN dropped from Spectrum. Now, this is probably one of the most cliche things when it comes to contract negotiations and kind of what's being on the short end of the stick if you're an end user who pays for cable or some streaming services. Sometimes you just don't get the product you're paying for because they can't make their decisions on the, on the top. Now, it looks like Charter Spectrum pulled the Disney Channel's an ongoing dispute. This issue is specifically or them wanting access to stream Disney's ad-supported streaming service for free in its package. Which again, I don't think that's going to happen because that's what draws people to buy direct Disney+. Plus. So I understand why Charter Spectrum would want that feature. It's a great thing to have in your portfolio of things to provide to your end users. But I'm sure Bob Iger, the CEO of Disney, is going to look at that and just laugh and go, no, we'll, we'll just take our business direct. As you've seen that business model become more and more prevalent, whether it's Nike doing more indirect or more direct sales, you have Tesla changing the automotive industry with direct sales model. Given the whole environment of the pendulum swing we've seen in e-commerce and business these days, going for direct consumer sales, I don't see, even with the vast amount of revenue that they do get from Spectrum, I don't think they're going to cave to that specific negotiation ask. And long term, I think Disney Plus will eventually become profitable someday. And it'll be interesting to see when that is, but in this case, it is unfortunate that consumers, they're kind of getting the short end of the stick. And subsequently, it caused both their stocks to, you know, decrease a little bit. Disney, as well as, interesting enough, Charter Spectrum, they both dropped around 3%. So, both hurt. It doesn't seem like anyone's a winner yet. How things will pan out? Mm, I would guess Disney's going to say no to that ask, but we shall see. Going on to the culture part of the podcast, we have Disney park workers twerking as that scandal also helps drop their stock as well. So they did have that contract negotiations with Spectrum where they dropped ESPN. So I contribute, I'd say probably 1% of their stock drop was attributed to this scandal. Now, it also shows you how fascinatingly, morally, Disney has just become so morally depraved, morally vacuous, as well as intellectually vacuous throughout the years. If you want to be at the clock, read any good, doc, read any good um, biography about Disney, Look at the old by um, old documentaries. We actually had the founders still involved in the company. It used to be a very, you know, a very professional place to work. Something where, you know, the men would suit up as every good man does. And they actually had these rare things, which are nuances lost in America these days, such as standards and values. Now, I know some people in America probably need a dictionary to read to find out what those things are. But needless to say, back in the day of Disney, you used to have to put in an effort and your manager would expect you to get tasks done and they actually ask you and they would expect you to act professionally. Back in the day, if you worked at Disney as a, they actually don't even call them employees when you work at the park, they're called, they have some hilarious um, staff, not staff members, a per, not a performer, it's when you're par, a part of a production. It's hilarious, it is kind of cute instead of calling them employees, they're called, oh, the name eludes me. Let me know in the comments. I'll think of it as soon as we're done with the episode. But they're called, not actors. All right, now, it's one of those things where it's in the back of your head, but you just have to know. What are Disney employees called? Oh, not stat. What is it? Cast members. That's what it is. Every single employee of Disney is a cast member. That's what it is. So it's one of those things where if you're a frontline employee working at Disneyland, which used to be one of the most magical places on time. They used to have very clean parks, very, they used to have morals, values. If you're a man, you couldn't have any facial hair. 
you actually, you're expected to actually look professional. You're expected to be clean cut every day. No smoking, no facial hair is very, some might call it uptight. Personally, I actually appreciate businesses that have any standards at all these days. Actually, a great way to differentiate from the competition. So Disney went to saying, hey, you have to be clean cut. You have to show up to work every day on time. No smoking. You got to be here. And they've gone from that pinnacle, or some would say the pinnacle of professionalism, to now they have employees with multicolored hair. You have men's dressing up in women's clothing at Disneyland. Employees. So you have biological men dressing up in Disney princess outfits, selling dresses to children. You also have Disney employees who are activists writing shows. And you have Disney employees, and I was going to say, instead of having clean cut, you know, well, Lord knows what they have for their hairstyles now. Now, it looks like these specific employees were actually caught because they're dumb enough. Again, I can't believe it's one of those things where they almost deserve to get in trouble. No, they do deserve to get in trouble, but it's almost as if everyone under 50 just thinks, oh, I have to put this on the internet. And then they get, then they wonder, why did I get shoplifting? Why, why did I get caught doing this? Well, you're stupidly projecting it for the whole world to see. You're literally giving evidence to everyone because well, it's probably also because of how narcissistic we are today as a modern society, unfortunately. But it looks like they actually are launching an investigation. So I'm actually surprised Disney's doing anything about this. I'm surprised the execs at Disney weren't applauding this morally depraved behavior where you have, again, this instance, you have employees in their costumes twerking and putting it on social media. Whereas twerking is, it usually looks like someone who's having a seizure or they're under the influence of drugs. Well, they usually are under the influence of drugs but is a pejorative dancing with sexual themes. Of course, not at all appropriate for, well, unfortunately nowadays probably is appropriate for modern Disney. I'm surprised they're doing an investigation at all. Now, it looks like you have Disney are allegedly launching an investigation after employees at their Anaheim, California, makes sense, were caught on camera twerking while dressed up as their family-friendly cartoon characters were family-friendly. Now, you also have, there's another controversial clip going around that depicts a life-size Pinocchio doll placed in position to simulate a sex act with Captain Hook, of course. Now, it looks like a number of clips were posted on a TikTok account called Illegal Disney, which, again, if they have a modicum of intelligence at Disney and IT, they should be able to find out who this is pretty damn quick. Now, I'm perhaps overestimating their capabilities to be actually capable of anything, but it looks like... That account, the whole account aims to share behind the scenes secrets and footage of the Disney theme parks. And as of Saturday evening last week, the account is still up and running. So I shouldn't be too surprised with given the current Disney staff and who they hire. I can't help but think these are just going to become more and more prominent. And again, it blows my mind that there's an article a couple weeks ago about a man who spent, I believe it was $4,000 on Disney tickets. Like, I don't know how people are going, going bankrupt going there. That's just for the stupid tickets. They have to pay for the food and all that kind of stuff. It blows my mind that people are still, after all this, still willing to pay for Disney. Will they ever change? Will consumers continue to pull back? Or is this a new business strategy? It'll be interesting to see. Let me know, like, let me know like, the comments. Would you still go to Disneyland? Would you take children to Disneyland or Disney World these days? I can't help but think the quote, quote, happiest place on the planet may just be for morally vacuous, perverse adults these days. But that's just my three cents. It used to be two cents, but 40 year hyperinflation, thanks to the government, I, I, gotta, I gotta say that's my three cents. Should charge four, but I'm a generous man, just three cents. Though, still free to click that subscribe button. Other interesting business series, you have Elon Musk versus the Anti-Defamation League. Now, it's one of those fascinating things where, like many political organizations and many ideas, Back in the day, they, that organization did some great good. They actually stood for things called morals and values, which again, are kind of lost nuances in modern American society, but they actually had good intentions, which, although many would also argue, we all know what the road to hell is paved with. Now, since that time, the ADL has completely, again, the Anti-Defamation League, they're an extremely progressive, also known as left-wing, interest group, and they have a long-time track record of attacking platforms that do not be well, bend the knee to their version of free speech. And they're very good and very effective at going after those companies and blackmailing them by scaring off advertisers, claiming, again, that it's anti-Semitic. Now, if you ever listen to Ben Shapiro, he actually has a, he one, one of the most longest successful podcasts. 
he has a long track record of calling them out when you know the ADL will actually not criticize people in the government, specifically Democrats, when they say anti-Semitic things, but they'll go after the competition for things that aren't even anti-Semitic. So kind of shows where their political allegiance is. Now, Elon Musk tweeted that they are slurring Twitter by falsely claiming they are anti-Semitic and thereby driving advertisers away, which is true. That's what they've been doing lately more and more. Now, it looks like, to be clear, and this is, again, a tweet from Elon. He says, quote, To be clear, our platform's name on the matter of anti-Semitism, it looks like we have no choice but to file a defamation lawsuit against the Anti-Defamation League. Oh, the irony. Now, that got 47.3 million views and 361,000 likes. So not the best ratio, 0.76%. And he also continued to say, quote, another tweet, or in this case, a post, whatever you want to call it these days. He says, quote, to be clear, I'm pro free speech, but anti, but against anti-Semitism in any kind. That got 68.7 million views and 364.7 thousand likes. So even worse, like ratio 0.53. Now, that being said, I do believe he has a damn good point because, again, they're going after... It seems like the whole world is going against Elon. Every government entity is going after him. Ironically enough, kind of just shows where they are politically, where, wind back the clock, clock four or five years ago when he was only making EV cars, the government loved him. Every media outlet praised him. And then he decided to do something as audacious as standing up for free speech. The audacity, dear God. And, of course, he has not conformed since. And can't help but notice they're all going after him pretty heavy. Now, in terms of will he win that lawsuit, that's going to be pretty difficult to prove, pretty damn near impossible to prove, may I say, because in order to win a defamation suit against a public figure, you need to show malice, and that's, again, a pretty very difficult standard to show. So unless, and again, this is all speculation, I'm not a legal scholar, just, just building upon analysis that I've read earlier, perhaps he'd have to actually have leaked documents from the ADL showing that they were intentionally and knowingly lying about Elon Musk and X, or formerly Twitter, in order to drive the advertisers away. But it is true. The advertisers are fleeing in part because of the ADL. The irony is unpalatable. It'll be interesting to see how Elon combats this, because again, their platform still isn't breaking even. It's still not making a profit. And since he took over, about 50% of the advertisers just left. And... Most social media are dependent on advertisers to actually make a profit. So it'll be interesting to see what, what is he going to do to make them break even and then make a profit. Apparently, there's not enough people paying for Twitter Blue. And since they've inducted or they've done more censorship, I don't suspect anyone's going to sign up for Twitter Blue. I think a lot of people are going to choose not to renew their subscription because they're, not, they're more courting and appealing to the advertisers, which inherently means more censorship and less free speech. So a lot of people who originally believed in Elon, including myself, paid for the Twitter Blue and now we see them starting to censor things more, more, more. Well, that's not what we're, that's not what we paid for. That's not what we were promised. So when the time comes to renew, I can't help but think more and more people are going to choose to not. And that'll make the situation worse, worse for Elon because now he's alienated the people who first believed in him and want free speech. And now the advertisers because they're not going to be happy until everyone is censored. So it seems like Elon is stuck between a rock and a hard place. I don't know what side he's going to choose or maybe he's just going to acquiesce and listen to... Linda Macarena. I know her name is uh, Yakarina, but Macarena sounds cooler. And I bet she does a good Macarena, if I were to guess. Maybe he'll just acquiesce to the current CEO, which many people... Her whole background is advertising. She's going to acquiesce to the advertisers because that's her job, is to make the, make it profitable. Who will succeed? That's... They'll be curious to see what time shall tell. Other interesting cultural news. You have Budweiser doing another tweet, and it falls flatter than the beer. Now, it looks like Budweiser had a tweet that said... Quote, perk of a long weekend. Your Sunday beer doesn't have, have to be the last beer of the weekend, unquote. Which, I don't know how illogical that is. Sunday is technically the last day of the week, but it is also the last day of the weekend. And I don't know how sad your life has to be. Why are you drinking a beer on a Sunday? I suppose the sports balls games are on the Sunday, so they're hoping that the football teams and all that kind of stuff will come back to them. I don't think they're going to get those sales back. Now, these statistics are all taken within the first nine hours, or at the nine-hour mark, rather. And that tweet, again, multi-big company, a lot of 
a big company, the biggest company, used to be sell the most beer of all time. Some might say the best, but not so much these days. It used to be the number one selling beer in North America. They should be pretty popular on social media, but they got only 15,600 views. That's it. That's nothing for a major brand like them. And of that 15,600 people who saw that tweet from Budweiser, 121 people liked it. That's nothing. That's not even pe- that's not even the people who work there. Although I can't help but think they're probably so ashamed of their company to still be working there, they wouldn't publicly support them on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call a new app. And if you break it down in percentage, that's 0.77%, which is not too good. Now, of course, most of the responses were highly entertaining, and most of them were negative. And of course, it was ratioed in minutes. Now, you have our favorite, Rich Mooney. He actually quote saying, Budweiser speaks of purse of a long weekend. What are you drinking during this Labor Day? Unquote. And then he asked, you know, Anheuser Bush or not Anheuser Bush in that product. Now, he got 32 votes. And interestingly enough, is the highest percentage 84.4% said no Anheuser Bush in Bev. Now, previously, it was between 94 and 98% saying no Anheuser Bush in Bev for me. I partially suspect because they're just ramping up the censorship like no, there's no tomorrow. And I'll dive, that, dive more into that in a second here. And of course, they're actually starting to hide his polls too, which again, it's a poll asking what you prefer. How in, and again, he's not labeling that pejoratively. He's not saying the poll, Bud Light sucks. Well, it does, but he's not being malicious in this poll. It's an unbiased poll saying, hey, what are you going to drink this weekend? And even that, kind of like how some people politically speaking are scared of facts and logic, it seems like Bud Light and Budweiser are doing the same. Now, another popular of the responders was from George, and George just did a picture of Dill Mulvaney with long hair, which of course was a precipice of this whole controversy in the boycott. Again, this brilliant marketing campaign by Alyssa Heyerschelder. She will be remembered forever. I guarantee you that. Now, George's tweet of Dill Mulvaney with long hair got again, biological man, George got 170 views and four likes, which not a lot of likes, but that's still 2.35% ratio. Pretty good ratio. You also have some by the name of Mr. Political Clips saying, quote, unquote, here for the hidden tab. He got 216 views and five likes, so 2.3%. Now we go to the blocked messages, which of course are highly entertaining as usual, which you have the usual graphics of Dill Mulvaney and suggested positions, holding up the can that led to this downfall of Bud Light and Anheuser Bush. Now, Rich Mooney's tweet that was blocked said, quote, they blocked so many people even to have, oh, sorry, they have blocked so many people even to have much of one. That's, that's why they don't have anyone here, pro or con, Bud Light just sent my unbiased poll to hidden replies, unquote which is true. They literally hid his unbiased polls and his responses. And here's more and more of that. They, Bud Light specifically blocked my personal account because I had the audacity to just tweet a picture of a Yangling light and a Yangling bottle in front of my American carbon fiber steel, stainless steel flag. And I said, thanks for the reminder, Bud Light, I just got some Yangling. And they blocked me for that. They haven't blocked the show. The show, the topping show has a Twitter handle and I use that for to advertise some of the clips that we do and some of the show episodes. They haven't blocked that, interestingly enough. And that's the one where I actually have a meme of the This Is Fine meme where I put the face of the Bud Light CEO on it after you know the little caption is $390, $400 million lost. And he's just smiling perpetually. And then he said, you know, this is fine. So they didn't block that account, interestingly enough. Now, some of the, and again, all the positive responses, I looked at the profiles, they're all BS. So specifically, you have someone by the name of Alex Shagag, or Sash, Sashag. This person says, quote, love it, thank you, bud, unquote. Now, I looked at her profile, and all this person does is just repost everything that are for free sweepstakes. Now, we've seen this before over the previous weeks. There's apparently a Twitter handle called Millions, where it sounds like a scam. You just retweet, and you have it. If you retweet them, you'll get a chance to win like a hundred dollar gift card or some crap like that. So this person, all they do is repost millions and sweepstakes. And you do another person by the bear, another person had a positive response to the Bud Light saying, quote, never the last beer, unquote. Now that person, I looked at Blair Griffin's profile. All they do is repost for again, sweepstakes. So 
These aren't like actual real cognitive people. They're either bots that just automatically repost sweepstakes so someone could make some money, presumably, or they're shills. But I can't help but think and wonder, even with all this censorship, all of it, it's the negative comments are still brewing to the surface. The percentage on the poll of like who would buy Bud Light or who wouldn't buy it is changing a little bit. So they are slowly manipulating the data in terms of, you know, who's allowed to post or even, you can't even view it actually if you're blocked. So I'd use a different, uh, I actually haven't been blocked on Budweiser yet. Bud Light blocked my personal profile, but not the other one yet. And again, it's fascinating. All that censorship and still most responses are negative. So let me know in the comments, do you think, will they ever stop the censorship? Elon claims he's going to actually get rid of the block feature. That would be interesting if it actually goes through. There's a lot of rumors that it actually would disqualify the app from the Google store and the Apple store for terms of service or something. It'll be interesting to see, but I would say in terms of the outlook for Bud Light and Budweiser, Anheuser Bush and Bev, Magic 8-Ball says the outlook is still not so good. Now, going on to the political part of the podcast, you have Vivek Ramaswamy on the Ukraine wanting the U.S. to pay for the elections, or they won't have them at all. So these are all statistics, and then again, I'll read the I'll read the quote first before I dive in. The like ratios, all that good stuff. It is a little bit long, but let me go ahead and I'll quote it here. So this is a tweet from Vivek Ramaswamy, and he says, "Quote: Zelensky's veil to forego democratic elections to the Ukraine unless the American people foot the bill and cough up another 135 million." in funding represents the next level of extortion to the United States. Our nation is being duped by a leader in Ukraine willing to sacrifice his own nation's credibility as a quote unquote democracy and to gambit to secure even more money from US taxpayers. This is wrong. Vladimir Putin has acted in a craven manner, but that shouldn't trick the United, the US establishment into adopting the false narrative that Zelensky is a paragon of democratic leadership. He is not. In the span of two years, Zelensky has made moves that bear a striking resemblance to the tactics employed by Vladimir Putin. Zelensky's actions include the, balance, the banning of 11 opposition parties and the consolidation of all state media into a single entity. These actions not only mirror Putin's refusal to register opposition parties, but also extensive government control under the, meta, under the media landscape. We have more than fulfilled the U.S. commitments to Ukraine in the 1994 Budapest Memor Memorium even as we have badly violated James Barker's February 1990 not one inch commitment to the Soviet Union's then President Mikhail Gorbachev about limiting NATO expansion. We are, or sorry, we will be Uncle Sucker no more. With over $135 billion in funding already provided, Ukraine should easily be able to allocate 0.1% of that to pay for the election. Of course, the mainstream media and the establishment will say that any money that the U.S. sends to support Ukraine is strictly itemized and audited. So it can't be used in that way. This is a joke funnier than Zelensky could have written in his prior career as a comedian. Don't forget that in June, the Pentagon discovered a accounting error that artificially created an extra $6.2 billion for Ukraine without congressional approval. The notion that all money and military equipment being sent to Ukraine is being carefully tracked is deeply dishonest. Americans deserve the truth, unquote. So a little bit of a long quote, but of course it went viral. And he has a lot of damn good points. Again, $135 million. Why should we? We Zelensky wants us to pay to secure the election. I think, that, again, I, I kind of agree with his statement because, again, we've given them $135 billion. And yet, we still can't arm teachers in the United States to protect our schools. We can't put a Marine in front of every United States public school because it costs money. But we just gave them $135 billion. Really? We can't fix our roads in the United States in some areas, but we can give them $135 billion. Shows the United States priorities these days. Now, in terms of the response, and again, these statistics were all taken at the fifth hour mark, so five hours after he originally posted, he got 370,000 views and 3,852 likes, giving him a ratio of 1.04%. Now, this also goes to show the virality of Vivek comparing to him to the other Republican nominees who are trying to become president. I look at everything by Ron DeSantis, and if on their best day, they will hit around 350,000. And I think that happens maybe every other week. And they look at other candidates, such as Nikki Haley, her average hit, and then these are all statistics from LinkedIn views, is usually between 50, 
eh, 20 and 60. And this is just data I've looked at the past two weeks, looking at their Twitter profiles and all that kind of stuff. Now, it looks like most of the comments are positive for Vivek. You have Hajar Singh Kudra saying, quote, Thank you for your comments on U.S. relations with Ukraine and the questions you raised regarding Americans' role in Ukraine, in Ukraine domestic affairs. While it's crucial to scrutinize any foreign aid and hold all leaders accountable. That got 10,300 views and 61 likes. So not the best ratio of 0.59%. But it looks like most of the responses are pretty popular and supportive of Vivek. It's not too surprising if you think about it for many reasons. One of them being... Vivek was one of the only Republican nominees on the stage during the GOP debate who actually questioned why are we sending Ukraine hundreds of billions of dollars when, again, most Americans can't point to them on a map and it really doesn't help us out in much ways. You can debate that there are some goods that we buy for Ukraine, including fertilizer and Porsche parts, but does it really have a direct correlation to the United States? I mean, I, I've... I really want to hear the argument about protecting borders from the people who would acquiesce from protecting the United States borders, which is hilarious that the same people with the Ukraine flag on their profile pictures say that the United States should have open borders. But why, why if, if Ukraine gets them, why, why, why not us? That's, that's interesting. So most people on the look at responses are supporting Vivek. You have a couple of people like this is a biscuit lap. Interesting name. This person said, quote, I believe Biden is being blackmailed by Ukraine. He got 24 likes out of 1,276 views, which the best investment in history has to be Burisma and the U Ukrainian government paying Hunter Biden about, what was it, $74,000 per month for two years and now getting hundred and what was it, $135 billion. Like if you look at finances, that's the best ROI you'll ever get in your life. That The return on investment on that is unprecedented. And yeah, you do actually, it's funny, people deny the footage ex exists. Biden actually laughed when he was saying, oh yeah, I got that guy fired because I said, if you don't stop this investigation, you're not getting this hundred billion, or is it a billion dollars in, a in aid from the United States? Which some, that owner dictionary might call extortion or illegal. Some, some. So it's interesting to see Vivek kind of consistently staying viral as the topics keep growing to the forefront. It'll be, inter it'll be interesting to see what topics American people care about the most as the election slowly gets closer and closer, and what will be the deciding factors that lead them to decide which nominee they want for the Republican Party, and subsequently who they want as president for the United States. Now, other interesting political news, you have DeSantis on buying climate change hitting 300,000 views, actually a little bit more. Now, again, it's all relative for DeSantis. This is a very successful social media moment, because again, most of his tweets are getting between, I wouldn't say, 60 to maybe 100,000 views on the Twitter. Now, these statistics were taken at the 48 hour mark. So it took him 48 hours to get 342,000 views and 5,111 likes. So pretty good like ratio, 1.49%. Now, it's only about, eh, I wanna say, let's see. A minute 43 long, so not too long. And this specifically is from his uh, team, the DeSantis War Room, which you gotta give them credit. They do have a crocodile in their Twitter name handle, which I didn't know you can do. So it is creative. Joe Biden and corporate media have been blaming um, climate change for the natural disasters and the hurricanes. What do you think about that? Well, I think if you look, there was the, there was a storm that went on this almost exact track in 1896, and it had 125 mile an hour winds, just like this one. If you look at the state of Florida, the most powerful storm hurricane we've ever had is actually the anniversary is, is now. It's the Labor Day hurricane of 1935. It had 185 mile an hour sustained winds, the most powerful hurricane that's ever been uh, uh, made landfall in the state of Florida, probably in the United States, but certainly in the state of Florida. That ripped up parts of the Florida Keys. It killed hundreds of people. There were people that got caught up in the storm. Their, their clothes got ripped off their bodies. The, the wind was so strong. So I think that the notion that somehow uh, hurricanes are something new, that's just false. And, and we've got to stop politicizing the weather and stop politicizing natural disasters. We know from history, there have been times where it's been very busy in Florida, late 40s, early 50s. You had a lot of hits of significant hurricanes. So I think sometimes people need to take a breath and get a little bit of perspective here. 
But the notion that somehow if we just adopt, you know, very left-wing policies at the federal level, that somehow we will not have hurricanes, that is a lie. Uh, and that is people trying to take what's happened with, with different types of storms and use that as a pretext to advance their agenda on the backs of people that are suffering. And that's wrong, and we're not going to do that in this state of Florida. So pretty good speech. Brings up a topic that a lot of people are thinking about. In the United States, especially, the climate change debate has become a political one where, on average, you have people on the right saying, well, we think it's more important to actually keep the economy open, keep jobs in the United States. We debate what's the actual difference that would have on the outcome or in terms of the climate. If we were to shut down X amount of production of materials or goods in the United States, what's the debate on how much that hurt the economy versus what's the long-term actual impact on the planet? And on average, again, politically speaking, people on the left want to basically enact many, let's say, climate change initiatives that detriment are detrimental to businesses, manufacturing, and they claim if you acquiesce to those demands, the, the mother nature will just love us again, and bad things will magically stop happening if you just vote for them. An interesting political ideal, although it still wouldn't fix, again, China and India, which, again, contribute a majority of the greenhouse gas in the United States, and there's also debates on the climate changing throughout the decades, throughout the years, having changes. That's why, they, in my opinion, that's why they changed from global warming to climate change, because every year the planet wasn't getting warmer and warmer. They had to ch change the messaging, so no matter what the weather does, they're always right. I mean, it's fascinating to think that when my parents were in school, they were taught, the experts all told them, oh yeah, we, we, there's going to be global cooling, we're all going to die from it being too cold. Now, I think that manufacturing and, you know, output of gases, that does have an impact. What I want to know is, what's the statistical difference? I mean, a lot of these studies are saying, oh yeah, if we, we just kill the economy completely, we just stop production of everything, it would, over the next hundred years, it make a difference of one degree Celsius, or, or more accurately in America, one degree Fahrenheit. So, some of those things were, is it worth killing the economy and destroying more jobs in the United States? When the United States contributes, I think it's, what is it? Was it the number five, fifth or six? In terms of production of gas house emissions, is it really worth it? How much, again, how much of a difference will it make? Or again, what's gonna ha happen with the planet? My three cents when it comes to the whole climate change debate is, humans are very good at inventing things. And there actually are some cases where inventors will be able to suck out greenhouse gases. I know China is working in some fantastic technologies to clean up their cities because their cities are very dense. Lot, there's a lot of pollution there, so they're trying to figure out how do we clean this up. I think we will subsequently come to a new technology to either somehow clean the environment in terms of taking emissions out of the air, or it'll be new scrubbers that you put on production. You have the actual, you have the what we call the, the smog, not the smog, the pipes at factories where emissions come out. They actually have machines called scrubbers. Well, like it sounds, it actually goes through a bunch of fancy filters and it decreases the amount of emissions, negative emissions going into the atmosphere. So I subsequently think, realistically, we could even make the planet healthier. It'll be an invention that we come up with. I don't think the solution is kneecapping the United States economy because again, you look at, I believe every 1% drop in the US Every 1% increase in U.S. employment leads to about 35, 45,000 deaths. I mean, it's detrimental when you get rid of jobs. And again, the United States is already one of the most difficult places to manufacture anything. When you look at the global economy, when everything from lawsuits to cost of labor, there's a lot of incentives to manufacture pretty much everything overseas. The only exception being defense materials, where you have to have just because of contracts and national security, most of the components have to be manufactured in the United States. But most of the private sector there's so much incentive to manufacture offshore as well as having to deal with the EPA, which is notorious for shutting down businesses and destroying their lives. So I think it was a pretty good speech by DeSantis. It spoke to his, his user base. So it was a good move on the political chessboard. And he did get more positive responses. And it's one of those fa fascinating things where kind of like Ted Cruz on social media, they don't seem very popular, but when people vote, they do get a majority of the votes. So, you know, Ted Cruz is still in office. So this is fascinating where, again, you have different voting demographics. Not everyone is on social media 24 seven, but on average, DeSantis's feedback or the responses on Twitter are usually mis mixed at best. 
Now, again, this isn't DeSantis' personal Twitter handle. It's the DeSantis War Room, but still. Now, it looks like a couple of positive responses were saying, this is from Josh McCall, saying, quote, Since NHC archive data begins in 1851, two of the top 20 deadliest hurricanes have occurred since 1960. Camille in 1969 and Katrina in 2005. Yeller 18 occurred in the 109 period between 1851 and 1959. Quite the downward trend. Here's a full report and they linked to NOAA. Now that got 7,796 views and 106 likes. So pretty good ratio coming in at 1.0 or 1.36%. Now you also have someone by the name of Thiss Burr saying, quote, correct, voting Democrat and taxing ourselves into poverty is not going to change the weather one bit, unquote. That one got 3,381 views and 109 likes, giving the ratio of 3.22. So quite impressive. And actually, building upon that note, if it's true that, you know, if we enact certain policies, Mother Nature will love us and embrace us and never hurt us again, why are there constantly national disasters in California? It's been Democrat-controlled, I believe, ever, what was it, 40 years now? 40 years plus? They, they're, they've shut down manufacturing completely. There's no automotive headquarters there anymore. They used to have many automotive companies headquartered in California. A lot of the Japanese brands, actually, some of their first U.S. headquarter offices were in California. Now you have Honda over in, I believe, Ohio. You have Tesla famously coming to the, the best state in the union, Texas. And what was it? Also, Toyota came to Texas. Will California learn from their business blunders, or in this case, political blunders that lead businesses to leave in droves? I think not, but again, all the environmental policies they want exist already in California, but they consistently have more natural disasters than a book you can fit in a book. So that should be a good little mini use case. But of course, kind of like the idiots, or uh, what's a nice way, mentally vacuous or lower, people who are lower on the evolutionary chain, also morally vacuous, people who believe in communism, they will always argue, well, it was never truly communism. Like, it's never really been tried. Now, this is also perhaps because American schools have all-time low test scores for history. And I know common sense eludes most people these days, but can't help but see some parallels between the two arguments. Well, it's never truly been tried. Well, the policies have never really been pushed through. They, all, most of the environmental policies you want exist over in California. But I digress for now. You also have a response from someone called, quote, or this is from a reality check. And they said, quote, I'm very concerned that people don't see this. Reads, please. Amplification, big time. He needs to go nuclear, unquote. Now, interestingly enough, the U.S. should go nuclear physically as well. F nuclear fission and nuclear fusion is one of the most cleanest, most effective ways to generate electricity. So if you really cared about the environment, you'd love nuclear energy. I would also argue it's 100% recyclable because the depleted uranium, those are brilliantly engineered. They can be used for tank busters. It's one of the densest materials on the planet. Militaries love to use them as tank rounds. So you have the little tank cartridges where you have, well, traditionally, if you have a rifle cartridge, it's a copper metal jacket. We have a lead core, so the main core is lead. and have a copper jacket around it. And when it comes to tank busters, you have the same thing, but with a tank, you have a depleted uranium core because it's so dense, you can actually break through the opposition tanks. Hence the term tank buster. So you can also argue it's green in that way as well. But ironically, those are the same people who say nuclear, nuclear energy is evil. Can't use that. Ridiculous beyond all belief. Now, that got, that statement got 5,012 views and 65 likes. So pretty good coming in at 1.3% like ratio. Now, I, I can go all day, but we'll just do one more. You have someone from DFF, and this is actually one of the negative ones. They pejoratively say, quote, don't, and again, I'm going to concise because they said ever like 20 times, of course. So they say, quote, don't ever, 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 ever allow this diabolical, no, you're most of the kids, uh, jackass to become president of the USA, unquote. That person got 397 views and 21 likes. So interestingly enough, the best ratio on the platform, or at least the response is at 5.29%. So it is interesting in terms of the breakdown of his tweets, that is one of the most popular ones. Also, but not just by number of views, but most of the comments were supportive of him. And again, I think the people who support DeSantis that was a good move on the chessboard. I agree with the statement. The people who support DeSantis, a lot of people in the, Republic, the Republican Party, they're going to agree with those statements that he brought up and his good historical data. Now, again, he needs to get this message out. He is kind of geographically limited at the moment because, again, unfortunately, there's a natural disaster in Florida. So he's there helping at the moment, which, politically speaking, he needs to be there for that reason as well. But 
he really needs to start going on podcasts. That's what Vivek is doing really well. That's what the competition is doing very well. Additionally, they're all going on social media. They're embracing, they're leaning into it. I think this is going to be one of the biggest selections where the legacy media in terms of the traditional cable box, I think it's going to be play a less and less important role. It's fascinating. The GOP debate actually streamed on Rumble, which is one of the fastest growing alternative streaming platforms out there, as well as hosting videos. And I'm actually looking into posting all the clips right now. I'm posting the one minute episode summary, as well as the whole episode every day on Rumble, as well as traditional YouTube. And of course, every major podcast platform as well. So it'll be interesting to see how that evolves with this political campaign and what role it plays. Other interesting political news, you have Nikki Haley joining the women's sports debate. Now, this kind of shows you how much Fox News has acquiesced and bend the knee to mainstream media. A lot of people don't even consider Fox News conservative anymore because they've abandoned so many what used to be core Republican conservative issues. And during the debate, I can't help but notice they didn't ask a single Republican primary candidate about the women's sporting issue, which is a growing issue in the United States specifically. It's a big political, cultural point of contention that a lot of people are debating because apparently people are confused. They think women and men should be able to compete on the same teams, which again, I know, I know United States public test scores at all time low. If you take a real biology or health class, you'll see that there are differences between men and women, a myriad of things that men are better at and a myriad of things that women are better at. And biologically, there are some vast differences, not just in bone density, body structure, muscle fiber, re reaction time. There are a lot of physical advantages that in some cases men excel at, and in some cases women excel at. There's reasons for the dawn of time we've had separate sporting categories, because that's what is fair. It's quite literally comparing apples to apples, or in this case, perhaps nuts to oranges, no peaches. I don't know. Let me in the comments. There's probably no nuts to what's not a good food. Eh, it loses me at the moment, but you get the metaphor. I'm sure. Or I would hope now, interestingly enough, Fox news actually allowed her to speak on this issue, which I was shocked as well. Now this is a tweet that she had and for her, it did good in terms of the number of hits and number of reactions. We'll break that down in a second, but I'll read the text. She has a text in the video. So the text, she says, quote, this is one of the most important women's rights issues of our time, and the so-called feminists have been silent. This is not okay. It's time to ban biological men from women's sports, unquote. So that's her kind of her tee up for this little video clip here that she posted to her personal Twitter profile. This is complete insanity. We've got to snap out of it, get rid of all this cancel culture, get rid of all this woke stuff. They've been pushing strongly for biological men to compete in women's sports. You're canceling our girls, and we can never let that happen. You call this an attack on women's rights. It is absolutely abusive. The idea that our girls are having to worry about who's in the locker room with them. They shouldn't have to deal with this right now, and who's helping them? We need them to be confident. We need them to feel good about themselves. We need them to understand that they are valued. What are you doing when you're allowing biological boys suddenly to intrude in their locker rooms and in their sports? This is the, the women's issue of our time, and we need to be fighting for our girls. And I will always fight for the fact that strong girls become strong women. Strong women become strong leaders. That does not happen when you put biological boys in women's locker rooms. That does not happen when you take a biological boy and have him compete against women in sports. We have to protect our daughters on this. It's that important. So it looks like that was kind of a political complex compilation of a bunch of clips that she's done. And again, interestingly enough, again, she needs some more marketing help in my opinion. A lot of people didn't know this about Nikki Haley apparently. So for her, it did quite well on social media. Now, again, this is statistics all taken within the first five hours. So she tweeted and five, hour, five hours later, I looked at all the statistics for it. Now it looks like she got, again, this is good for her, 57.4 thousand views in the first five hours and 1,238 likes. So not too bad. That's actually one of the best ratios, 2.16%. Now it looks like you have a couple positive responses. You have a couple of negative ones, but in terms of pol political reach, I don't know if she's, she might be one of those people where they actually should pay for, I know there's a certain 
certain features on Twitter or X, whatever you want to call it now, where you can actually pay to promote your tweet so more people will see it. And again, I don't know what the breakdown is of her funds for the campaign, um, but she definitely needs to do something different because, again, for her personally, like in terms of like a personal record, this is pretty good because, again, she got 56,000. Well, that's a lot more than I get, admittedly. But she got 56,000. But, I mean, if you look on average, just looking at her profile, I, get, I mean, the average view is around, what is this? 20 to 40,000. You have one, let's see, she had one about Kamal Harris that got 66,000. But again, it's just 20,000, 20,000. There's one, okay, one broke 100,000. And there's a tweet about North Korea, Russia, another 20,000, another 17,000. It's just underwhelming amount of views compared to the competition where you have Vivek and even DeSantis. They're getting a lot more views. And again, she needs to get this message out there. She needs as many people know about this issue. I actually think this is a winning political issue in the United States at this moment. So it's a good move on the political chessboard. I think there's a lot of people in the United States, especially in the middle of the political aisle, as this has become a politically divisive issue somehow. I mean, wind back the clock 20 years ago, no one, this would not be even spoken about. It'd be so utterly ridiculous. People would laugh at you if you even suggested it. But nowadays it's become a political issue where you know, on average, if you're someone who's on the right side of the political aisle, you believe biological women and biological men should have separate sporting categories. You shouldn't have biological men joining the women's sporting teams and beating the actual shit out of them, pardon the French, which has happened literally, unfortunately. I actually have, famously in the UFC, you had some morally vacuous, I'm trying to think of a good way to describe this man. You know, morally vacuous is a pretty good one. The rest of the, I would say harsher words, but they just get me deplatformed. So I actually had a biological man beat the crap out of women in the UFC, and then later, after a couple fights, then he admitted, oh yeah, I'm actually a biological command. Been a biological command for what was it, 30 plus years of his life? So a lot of people thought that was morally, morally abhorrent because again, the person fighting this person, the guys going up, the gals going up against them, they had no idea what, the, what situation they're getting themselves into. So in terms of political discord and discussions around the issue, a lot of people started to change their opinion about this controversy after that UFC fight. I know a lot of my friends politically who are more aligned in the middle, including myself, who are thinking, well, this doesn't, just do a gut check. It doesn't feel right. This man beat the crap out of a woman. And again, that's happening more and more. Fascinatingly enough, if there's no differences, as some people claim, no differences at all, why are biological women not joining men's sports and setting world records every day? It's because obviously men and women are inherently different in a myriad of ways. Some things men are better at, some things women are better at. It used to be, not, I can't believe it's controversial to say that, but apparently now it is. Now, in terms of the responses from Nikki Haley, you have someone by the name of Samir Khan saying, quote, Rad Femmes have been talking about this for dec decades. Where on earth has you, have you been? Unquote. That got 684 views, 11 likes, giving it a 1.6% ratio. Now, I don't know how accurate that statement is. I don't think this has been going on, I don't think this has been happening in decades. I mean, decades means at least 20 years. So, I mean, realistically, I thought this was, well, when did Bruce Jenner uh, change teams? I'm trying to remember, that was kind of, that was another tipping point or another thing that kind of brought this conversation to the forefront, the United States politics and cultural speaking. But the sports thing, I don't think has been an issue. I think Leah Thomas is the first biological man to join the women's swimming team at U, at least UPenn. And of course, broke all the records. Went from like the 500 best, best male swimmer to the number one female, or number one best swimmer in the female category, I should clarify. Now, you also have someone by the name of Bad Brothers. Interesting name. They say, quote, Nikki was less concerned about your, oh no, sorry, Nikki, we, we are less concerned with your stance on women, women's sports than your stance on bombing women's overseas, unquote. Now, that got 189 views and three likes at a 1.58% like ratio. Now, in terms of politically speaking, I don't think she's too, I don't think that's, very specific to her. I mean, it is, that's her stance, but that's the stance of many Republican nominees, or in this case, they're all, you know, they're fighting to be the, they're all fighting to get the nominee to be the Republican candidate for the 24, 2024 election. Most of the people on the stage actually were very pro pumping more money in the Ukraine, saying it's somehow vital to our, our national interest. I don't know how, 
Yeah, Porsche parts are important, don't get me wrong. Someday I would love to own a Porsche and move, although as much as I lo love my little Honda with the stick shift. But a lot of the Republican candidates are saying, yeah, we should keep, we should keep doing this if anything escalate. So I don't know if this is really specific to her. I mean, it is, but it's mostly Republican candidates and of course the whole Democrat party these days. You also had another response from Let the Birdie Die saying, quote, I love how you guys keep acting like this is an issue that affects 0.001. Yes, I said 0.001 of all women's athletes is a national crisis. That coming in at 362 views and 21 likes. Giving a good ratio of 5.8%. Now, that being said, just because something isn't a big deal statistically by the number of people affected by the issue does not mean the issue is not an issue in and of itself. There are many women who are actually losing scholarships in, for colleges and lifetime opportunities because they're being stolen by biological men who are joining the women's categories who have an inherent advantage. And a lot of people feel that's not fair. So politically speaking, I think it was wise of her to choose this, I would say this political topic and cultural topic. I think she should emphasize it more in her campaign. She might get a little bit more support. It'll be interesting. I don't know if Vivek has specifically addressed this issue. I believe DeSantis has. And again, it's something that they should have all been asked at the primary debate. But we know Fox News just bend the knee and acquiesce to have a boring debate as usual, even cutting off the candidates when they actually start to debate each other, which is why we tune in. No, 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 can't have a real debate. We, we, we don't want a real debate. We just want your canned answers, which are moderately useful. They're a little useful. You know a little bit more about the candidate, but a lot of them were things you already knew. I mean, some people actually want to debate so you can actually see the debate. But I partially digress. Time shall tell to see. She's, for the past couple months, she's been pretty far back in the polls when you look at the, you know, who's most likely to become the Republican forerunner. It'll be interesting to see, does this help push her ahead of the competition? Could she get closer to Vivek? Could she overtake DeSantis? With all the data we have right now, I would say the odds are not good, but it'll be interesting to see what the next polls say. Now, going on to the business blunder of the day, you have Best Buy firing the whistleblower that brought sunlight into the dark, morally vacuous crevices of Best Buy. Now, Best Buy is known for selling electronics. They've been around for quite some time. They've had some success throughout the years, headquartered over in Minnesota. For years, they've been very much left-wing, politically speaking. And it's one of those things where you actually had an employee who was not too happy about the religious discrimination that he was suffering at work. Now, fascinating enough, Best Buy, and of course, this isn't, this isn't all too uncommon, unfortunately, these days, where they are selective about which religions you are allowed to practice at work. Now, at Best Buy, they, if you go into, their, into the actually back-end logistics where the Geek Squad is and employees are sitting, so the back end of the office and the corporates, as well as the outlet stores, they have a bunch of LGBTQ flags, books, pins, everything, but you're not allowed to have a Bible. Why not? If you believe in what, why can't, why are you only allowing certain people and groups to express themselves? That seems pretty morally vacuous to say the least. Can't have a cross on your, you can't wear a cross? Really? But you can wear a pin that supports the other thing. Seems pretty selective and discriminatory to me. And interestingly enough, they actually won't allow you to become a manager depending on your nationality. And of course, as cliche as it sounds, you know which nationality they would not allow into their manager trainee program, white folks. So they specifically said on the questionnaire of who qualifies to become manager, you had to add three things. Now, first of which makes sense. The first is you have to work there for at least a year. That makes sense. They want to make sure you're invested in the company. You've been there a while. The second is you have to be employed in good standing. Also known as you're not getting written up for being late. You're performing adequately or above average. And then thirdly, you had to choose, you had to be one of five minority ethnicities. I believe they said African-American, Pacific Islander, Asian-American. They noted everything except white folks. So thereby you could not apply. And you had an employee who actually was brave enough to come out and say, well, you're discriminating against my religion. That's why I came to the United States. The United States used to be a place where every American believed in things like morals and values and actually freedom of religion, freedom of speech, the Second Amendment, but unfortunately, times have changed. Now, this gentleman actually says specifically, and this is Enos Sujak, he's a former Geek Squad member, he said, quote, 
My family fled religious persecution in Serbia so I could live my life as a Christian without being prosecuted for my beliefs, yet that is exactly what is happening. He says, On September 1st, 2023, Best Buy terminated my employment because I stood firm against my workplace discrimination based on my religion and I exercised my right to be a Christian. Now, it looks like Sujek was a Serbian immigrant. Again, this is from Daily Wire. He was a Ser uh, Serbian immigrant living in Jacksonville, Florida. He recently exposed his conversation with his manager in Best Buy, giving the information to James O'Keefe of O'Keefe Media. And during his conversation, Sujak and his manager, Mike Hirsch, he asked, why are LGBTQ flags appropriate in the office, but Christian crosses were prohibited? And this is after he walked out of an employee session about history of the LGBTQ community and in the workplace and a well-being and being a well-being ambassador. Now, imagine if you reverse this, how, how irate corporate media would be if a business had the audacity to actually give a Bible seminar. Or they actually said, hey, this employee, maybe they're Hindu or they're Jewish, you have to come and learn about the Bible and Jesus. You have to learn about the Christian faith in order to work here. You would have lawsuits of the wazoo. You'd have protests in seconds. And yet, the corporate media is all too fond of supporting these types of initiatives, or rather this type of discrimination. And he continued to say, let's say all over the hub, we can't have Christian stuff all over. And he says, they're, and the manager currently says, quote, they're not the same. Adding that you, you're, you are choosing to believe in Christianity. They, they in regards to the LGBTQ community, they, they didn't choose it. And Shujik told O'Keefe that he had a long conversation with his manager about work appropriate symbols. Leading on to say, quote, it was like an hour and 30 minutes of he and I just going back and forth and him telling me that it was work appropriate to have all this LGBTQ stuff in the offices and, and everywhere else. But it's not okay for to you know be a christian myself and have a bible right over there that's right there in the office or have a cross or a quran or anything like that can you just say quote the guy said quote that's not work appropriate but you know having lgbtq clear everywhere is that is work appropriate and i wasn't standing for that now the company's website claims are an equal opportunity policy which no one believes anymore and they claim that they oh well, yeah this is yeah, they claim, you know, they will not discriminate based on age, race, gender, creed, religion, ethnicity. Oh, really? Well, not so much. As cliche as America has become, the one butt end of every joke, as well as active discrimination, is Christians and Catholics. Someone's got a cliche, will they ever stand up for themselves? Now, thankfully, there are some lawsuits that are actually being filed to support gentlemen like this who have been discriminated against. And it'll be interesting to see, do people start to protest Best Buy more and more? It is perhaps the easiest protest of your life, considering you can buy electronics pretty much anywhere else. You've got great companies like Time Technologies if you own a business and need IT hardware. But realistically, if you don't need business grade, you just need consumer grade products. Why don't you just go to Walmart? They've got darn near everything. They've got your food, they've got your bikes, your tires, batteries, you get a laptop there. You get an HDMI cable there. Prior to this incident, I went to Best Buy once in the past, what was it, four, three or four years? And it's because an HDMI broke, or a cable broke, and I wanted something for a meeting later in the day, so I had to have it. So I went to Best Buy, and they didn't have one in stock. It, and again, that was my, me being foolish to think they'd actually have a modicum of customer support, or they'd actually have stock. Which, if you're Best Buy, your only job is to have crap in stock. If I, was, if I didn't care about having it immediately, if I didn't need it right then and there, I'd just buy it online because it's not time sensitive. Yet Best Buy didn't have an HDMI cable. How I still can't, that still blew my mind how poor planning that is, how pathetic it is. And again, just go to Walmart, go to amazon.com. There's another one. There's even places like Micro Center where they are more, bo more boutique curtailing to electronics. If you want a specific build on a computer or if you want a high-end gaming laptop. So there are many alternatives. There's Really no legitimate reason to go to a Best Buy, I would say. So it would be interesting to see, this is going to be a long-term cycle in terms of boycotting. I think the Bud Light boycott was very easy to see in terms of the sales results because, again, it's a consumable product. Most people who purchase alcohol probably purchase when they go grocery shopping, which I would say for most Americans is probably a weekly endeavor. And that is something that you buy at high frequency. You're able to see, you know, week over week, Bud Light sales are down between 27 and 30% compared to the same fiscal period last year. 
which is astonishingly successful with boycott, and a first for people who are politically on the right. Now, in terms of a Best Buy boycott, they, the company already said they're decreasing their forecast, and they're saying, oh yeah, we're, we're, the economy, you know, it's all bad, when their competition area is actually doing pretty good. But this is gonna be a longer boycott, because again, how, many, how often do you need a new laptop or new phone? Well, personally, I'd say, you know what, every five, 10 years? It's like, eh, or a new washing machine. Heck, go to Home Depot, go to Lowe's. There are many places, I know Best Buy has the home appliances as well, go somewhere else for that. So I think it's gonna be a long boycott, because again, the things you buy at Best Buy aren't consumables, they're more durable products that last, or they should last for years. So I think we'll see the effects long-term, but as this comes to the forefront, I think a lot of people are starting to see how unfair it is to only discriminate against one religion. And it's just morally vacuous to so plainly discriminate against not only managerial opportunities, but in this case, you can't even have a Bible at work. You can't even have a cross. Now, I understand the argument behind maybe an employee uniform. You're trying to be a non, um, you want the business to be apolitical. I understand that argument perhaps, but to not have a cross or a Bible at your desk, which again, these desks are not customer facing. This is kind of in the back office. So no consumers and no customers are seeing this business environment where they're saying you're not allowed to support your faith and your religion. So let me know, are you gonna be joining the Best Buy boycott? Will it be successful? How many, I mean, how many years do they still have left of being in existence? Do they even warrant an existence at this point? It'll be interesting to see, but as I always say, time shall tell. Thank you everyone for, again for taking the time to tune in. I know it's a high, high ambition. I'm trying to get to 4,000 subscribers by the end of September. So if you click that button, I would greatly appreciate it. Also really appreciate the comments and the likes. The comments really help build the channel, grow and develop, as well as if you have individual experiences with these topics, love hearing more frontline experience, whether it's the ongoing UAW United Auto Workers strike, or maybe someone who has some firsthand experience working at an automobile company who can maybe tell us why they're killing all these beautiful stick shifts to go with automatics. So any insight is also greatly appreciated. Also, don't forget to take the time to tell your family, tell your friends, tell your coworkers, heck, tell your enemies, tell anyone and everyone, just stay safe and fight the good fight.